I'm Don Smith, Executive Director of the West Virginia Press Association. I thank you for being here. This is panel three, and it was one of the panels that had the most interest among our editors around the state because I think it's a problem that regardless of your region or your newspaper or your uh, broadcast facility or your station, this is something that impacts your readers, viewers, and listeners. Um, Today, we welcome West Virginia DHHR Cabinet Secretary Bill Crouch, Senator Mark Maynard of Wayne County, Chairman of the Govern Government Organization and Member of Health and Human Resources, Senator Ron Stallings of Boone County, a physician and member of the Health and Human Resources Committee, and Delegate Matt Roboff, uh, Cabell County, Chairman of the House Select Committee on Prevention and Treatment of Substance Abuse. And we're gonna discuss what progress has been made on the drug problem in West Virginia, but also what needs to be done and how the opioid problem is affecting so many other areas such as foster care and uh, regional jails and all the problems it creates down, I think with the, we use the term downstream, when we talk about the natural gas industry, I'm not sure they'd appreciate us carrying it over, but downstream from our opioid problem. Christine Meyer of the Parkersburg News and Sentinel will be the primary moderator and I will assist. And with that, we're gonna, let our four panelists each have an opening statement, and I will start to my right with Secretary Crouch, if you're ready, sir. You can come to this podium, if you would, do your opening here, each of you, and then we'll do questions. You can remain seated. organization as uh, West Virginia departments go, but we really uh, focus uh, our priorities, I certainly focus priorities on three areas in, in West Virginia during my tenure. Uh, one is the drug problem. Uh, if we don't turn a corner on the drug problem, uh, we're going to have years and years and years of, of issues related to that. And we are doing a great deal, and I'm prepared to, to talk about that. Um, we are tackling this head on, and uh, I really can't, I said this uh, a couple of weeks ago, I really can't think of anything that we're not doing at this point that we've seen work in other states or that we have information on that, uh, that, that we should tackle that we haven't tackled. We are really focusing on, on reducing deaths, overdose deaths, and on getting people into treatment. The third piece of that really is to take care of, of mothers and, and babies. We, we, we have an issue there related to uh, 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 babies who are born with a neonatal abstinence, and we're tackling that issue as well. The second priority uh, of, of, of my tenure has been the child welfare system. I'm also prepared to talk about that at length. We've, uh, we've made some great strides there. We have some additional efforts in the works that we want to talk about, uh, and, and I'm prepared to talk about those. Uh, and really the third issue is, is uh, our facilities and the forensics issue, uh, which I may not get into today, but uh, I'm certainly prepared to talk about that as well. So thank you for the invitation. I'm happy to be here and look forward to participating. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Senator Mark Maynard from Wayne County. I represent Wayne, Mingo, McDowell, and Mercer County. I'm flattered to be invited to this uh, today and uh, be before you. I feel a little bit uh, out experienced among my colleagues up here, but uh, it's a topic that hits my district pretty hard. And so uh, I'm eager to do what we can to, to help that. Um, I'm also flattered to have been appointed to the Gov Org Chair recently, and my experience as Chairman of Rulemaking, Natural Resources, and Economic Development, um, just all, dealing with all the state agencies, especially in rulemaking, I can hope work all that in and, and uh, be able to do good things in the Government Organization Committee. I was just appointed as Chairman of the Prayer Caucus Foundation, which is a faith-based organization in 40 states, and they help promote faith-based legislation. and in my opinion, um, faith-based recovery is a good way to combat the uh, 
opioid addiction. Many times myself, I've been like at wit's end and think, uh, dear Lord, you know, I need some help in this. And it's just a, it's a good, um, I'm very flattered to be appointed as that, and I look forward to seeing what we can do this upcoming session. Um, um, I was also appointed to broad, Broadband Council in my district. You know, it's pretty underserved, so I'm hoping that we can um, get some things done with that and maybe provide job opportunities through that, which would, in a roundabout way, help the drug addiction problem. Um, Actually, I, I wasn't prepared to give a big speech about uh, from personally today. It's a good thing I, I didn't have time to prepare, or it would have been pretty lengthy. <laughs> um, in relation to the addiction recovery, I'm a firm believer in Proverbs 16:27. Idle hands are the devil's workshop. A lot of legislation I have introduced deal with recreation in West Virginia, and I myself have numerous hobbies. Even my small business is my hobby. Also, jobs are important to preventing addiction. If you are unemployed, you don't have to be anywhere early the next morning. If you're down on yourself for lack of a job or whatever else is not going right in your life. So an escape takes place, and then an addiction is formed, and it's a vicious, vicious cycle, which I'm speaking from this, from a secondhand view, and I don't really understand addiction, and I'm blessed that I don't understand it, but I want to know all I can. Um, I want to help the experts any way I can in recovery and take a leading role in prevention through economic development and job opportunities. I love all outdoor recreation, and I think that's the way that we can also help combat this drug problem. Uh, my preferred method is taking my Jeep out in the wilderness and seeing the beautiful scenery uh, in West Virginia. And uh, it's a hobby that's expensive, but it takes care of my idle time and, and my disposable income. And um, so I myself would like to see that and many other forms of outdoor recreation be made available and get in these people's blood to where they don't have time to be down on themselves and have a reason when their foot, feet hit the floor in the morning of, of something, purpose in life. Uh, speaking of, on February 1st, in the parking lot adjacent to the Culture Center here, there's going to be a uh, off-road vehicle press day that invites legislators, the press, and government agencies to come along with the West Virginia Jeep Club, which is a uh, professional 501c3 group located here in the Charleston area, and, and uh, they're going to take us out on a recreation excursion here in Kanawha County. So uh, I invite you all to that, 9.30 right here. Um, also, there's a press conference on the first day of session at 11 a.m. at the Senate steps for the uh, prayer, prayer caucus foundation. All the members, there's about 30, will be there. So uh, appreciate you um, having me here today, and um, I'll get my information to all of you in case you have any questions. Thanks. Governor Rubal. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm I really uh, I'm passionate about this topic, and when I got my invitation, I was excited. And I think the first thing, first of all, my name is Delegate Matt Rohrbach, and I represent 17th District in Huntington. Um, and I'm a physician, so um, I'm going to talk about some things here as we go. But the first thing I'd like to do is thank the press. And I'm going to tell you why I'm going to thank them. I first got elected to this legislature in 2014 and since then I have seen a steady concerted effort in the press not only in my community but all around the state to raise the awareness of substance abuse for that I thank each and every person in this room because you have helped mold and made possible for us what we've been able to get through this legislature. You have raised the awareness, and that has brought journalism in this state. You, you've helped this legislature tremendously. So for that, I personally thank you immensely. Um, on this problem, I'm going to tell you, I think this most serious problem this state's faced in the last five years. Our economic survival is at stake. We can't move forward when any employer 
that does a Google search or looking for a place to locate, they do a Google search about the state of West Virginia, what are they going to see? Our opioid problem. I recently completed a fellowship through the NCSL and on opioid abuse. And it was, it was some of the meetings I'd go to, they'd get people from the NIH and the Bureau of Public Health up there to speak, and they'd show the slides, and we were leading everything. And then they'd go around the room and ask people where they're from. They'd say, oh, I'm from West Virginia. Uh, they'd say, oh, we're so sorry for you. Well, I'm not sorry because we're going to fix this problem. Uh, we didn't get here overnight. We're not getting out of this overnight. But I guess I can tell you a little bit about why I'm standing in front of you today. Uh, I'm from Huntington, and, and you probably know the problem's been pretty bad there. Some people say it's ground zero. Uh, I decided to run after a span of about six months. In 2014, uh, I saw, well, actually in 2013, I saw four young people that I knew personally, young men in their early 20s, died, overdoses. These weren't strangers. These were my neighbors. These were people I went to church with people that I'd seen grow up, they're dead. And I remember telling some of the friends that I went to the last of the four funerals with, I said, guys, I'm running for office. They said, no, you're kidding us. I said, no, I'm not. So that's the, the sole reason I ran for this legislature was this problem. Now, it affects each and every one of us in this room and in this entire state, because as I said, we can't move forward I think tremendous steps have been made, but I'll be the first to admit we've got a lot more to do. Um, and I've got a whole list of things that we've done, and hopefully we can get into it. I can tell you I, I, there's 10 significant bills, I think, just in the last session that we passed, and I'm happy to talk about any or all of those. And I've got a list of um, 29 uh, bills here, and I'm happy to share it with anyone in this room. Uh, that we have passed, enacted into law in the last five years. That, uh, so your legislature is aware of this problem, and in large part, our constituents are aware now because of the work that the, that the media and the press have done. And for that, I do thank you. Uh, where are we going this year on my committee? Uh, last year was all about getting people back to work. Because as the speaker and the president alluded to, uh, we can argue all day long about what type of treatment is the best. But I'll guarantee you this, when individuals get to the end of that treatment, if they can't get and hold a job, it's not going to stick. It's just that simple. It's not going to stick. So um, I'd be happy to expound, but there were 10 very significant bills just last session. Uh, this session, we're going to go further. We have to get this problem under control. We have to get people back to work. And uh, we're also going to get into some other things this session. Uh, uh, but, but again, I'm happy to expound about that. But uh, again, I do thank you for the opportunity to be here. And uh, I look forward to answering questions and, and hoping to disseminate some useful information. So thank you. Senator Stallings. Thank you all. Uh, thanks to the West Virginia Press Association for hosting this and the sponsors, of course. I'm uh, Senator Ron Stallings. I have uh, been a physician in my hometown of Madison, West Virginia, for the past 34 years as an internal medicine and geriatric doctor. I've witnessed the daily struggles of uh, the folks when the, uh, when the economy downturns. And I represent uh, the 7th Senatorial District, which is Boone, Logan, Lincoln, parts of Wayne, and parts of Mingo County. So uh, I have uh, seen it in color, if you would, uh, with uh, grand families taking care of their grand nieces, nephews, grandchildren. Uh, and uh, I've seen the social determinants of health and the social determinants of education uh, have uh, major roles in. Uh, in West Virginia, and as 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 we know, these uh, you know poverty, the the uh, the root cause of a lot of these uh, issues is poverty, and the lack of hope and the lack of sense of purpose. Uh, what's been said here is uh, is dramatic. Uh, it is a crisis, uh, and uh, we absolutely have to get our arms around it. 
and it's, it's going to take everyone pulling in the same direction. Uh, you know, um, just when there was a huge increase in the demand for child protective services and foster care from 2014 to 2017, uh, in order to balance the budget, we cut the DHHR $207 million, just when we probably needed to be investing in it. And look where that got us. Uh, you know, 10,000 homeless children in the state, um, 40,000 children under 18 live in homes where the head of household is a relative other than a parent. You know the data. The data is stark. Uh, and, uh, and again, we, we just have to work hard. And a lot of times, some of the things that we do at the Capitol uh, have unintended consequences. And uh, so with regard, I, I'm, I'm probably the only person up here, obviously, that, that prescribes uh, pain medicine. Uh, so as a primary care physician uh, in cold country, in timber country, uh, I've seen uh, what happens. I've seen, I know the fact that there's about three different types of pain medicine. There's Tylenol, which most people would say doesn't help much. There's non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which kill people and put people in kidney failure and cause stroke and heart attack. And there's opioids, and there's the, uh, the other type, Neurontin and Lyrica. So we don't have a whole lot of tools in the toolbox. Now, what we have done is we've mandated coverage. We've, we've, you've noted that the number of opioid prescriptions has gone down dramatically. The number of overdose deaths have gone up dramatically because we didn't have a system in play to help these people that were going to the pill mills that were addicted. No longer could they get their hydrocodone or Percocet or something like that, and so they ended up on heroin or fentanyl. So, you know, we, we, we need to really work on this fine-tuning knob. The other thing that I've seen is that um, even patients with cancer are having trouble getting uh, pain medicine. Now, we've tried hard. We've tried hard. We put into, this, into our bill that says, basically, if you have cancer, then all these re opioid restrictive things do not apply to that particular patient. Doesn't matter. We, as prescribing physicians, are paranoid, paranoid about treating our patients who have legitimate pain. And we've done that. We've done that right up here at the Capitol. So the poor people out there suffering in pain, I worry about you, and we're going to try to basically uh, look at that pendulum. Even the studies from uh, uh, Dr. Coben and, and uh, the folks uh, th that, were, that are studying this found that the pendulum has gone too far. And again, the, the law enforcement people talked to me. They said, we don't have a prescription drug abuse problem. We've got other types of drug abuse. So we have to look at all these. We also have to look at what's been working. Huntington is a, is a model for, and I applaud uh, uh, Mayor Steve, Steve Williams for his leadership. You know, and basically we have to own the problem is the first thing. We can't say not in my backyard, this isn't here. Uh, we have to get recovery and we're talking about a full range of recovery that's been mentioned, including uh, getting back in the workforce. So there's a lot of good things going on in West Virginia. West Virginia, unfortunately, is a rural state, so it's hard to get them out to where a lot of the, uh, the problems are. So we need to work on that. Um, and again, I just want you to think about these adverse childhood experiences uh, that, uh, that are taking over our children. And if we can't invest and support the first thousand days, uh, then we're gonna lose another generation. So we have to look at this uh, adverse childhood experiences, look at the trauma-informed care. Um, and again, you know, if you take your own ACE score, you can look it up on Google National Public Radio and take the ACE quiz. Um, look at what's going on in Martinsburg, the, uh, all the things that are happening that, that really uh, can be uh, uh, redone in other parts of the state. But I think Huntington, if we look at any one place, we, we find that we can do some stuff. 
uh, in a positive way. It's going to take a while, but we can't lose another generation. We have to uh, look at these children that are being born. Thank you. All right, guys, I'm going to try to spread this evenly, um, but at the start of my work on this, my questions were almost solely focused on foster care, so I'm, I'm uh, coming from behind a little bit here. Uh, so I will start there um, with um, the possibility that a judge might dismiss the lawsuit filed against uh, a better childhood disability rights of West Virginia, or, or if you think that's a possibility, and if you think that it might de be dismissed, talk about some of the changes you said have been made that maybe weren't accounted for in the lawsuit and, and the work that's been done that, that you think um, they're, they're not talking about yet as they filed this. Certainly. Um, we filed that motion on November 26th to dismiss. Uh, we're hopeful that the judge will uh, review that uh, motion and <clears throat> make a, a decision to dismiss the suit. Uh, we truly don't think uh, this law firm has a role in, in the West Virginia child welfare system. Is that better? Yeah. <clears throat> so we're, uh, we're hopeful that it's dismissed. Um, this, this law firm, they didn't come into West Virginia. They didn't talk to me. They didn't contact me. They didn't contact our leadership. They didn't contact the commissioner, the Bureau of Children and Families. They came into the state to find clients. That's what they've done, my understanding, in, in the other states. So if they want to help us, uh, I will tell them the same thing I told the, the Department of Justice. We want a partnership. We want information. We want help. And that's what the Department of Justice has given us. We signed a memorandum of understanding to show them what we were going to do with regard to this problem. And we're following through with that. We're going to fix this problem. We're going to improve the child welfare system. In, uh, well, last year, uh, I think early in 2018, we added 60 CPS positions to the state of West Virginia. The way we did that was to look at caseloads in every county. And we set up a, a formula so that we added positions to every county to make sure the caseloads were not over 15. We also increased the legislature, who's been a great partner in this effort. They increased salaries 10% in 2017, 5% in 2017, 5% in 2018. We added another 10%. We went to the Department of Personnel. We got a 5% increase in those salaries. We took, uh, we took those positions, by the way, out of DHHR's budget, not asking for new money, new positions. We took vacant positions from throughout the department and converted those to CPS positions. In 2017, we added, I'm sorry, uh, 18, get mixed up with my years. 2018, we added a 2% addition in addition to the 5%. And the following year, we added a 3%. So with the 2%, the 3%, the extra 5%, and the legislative salaries, we've increased salaries 20%. In, in CPS workers. This is one of the hardest jobs in the state of West Virginia. It is very, very difficult to ask someone to go knock on someone's door and take their child from them. It is very, very uh, hard on the individuals who do this. So turnover is high. People, some people can't do this at all. They try it for three or four months and it just doesn't, it's, it's something they can't do. It's stressful. Uh, so we're looking at a way to c select better on the front end, uh, either a, uh, a, a predictive analysis program or a personality program to try to get better, a better selection on the front end. But we're looking at monitoring this. We are monitoring this much closer. So we're, 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 f we're doing a, a huge number of things to fix these problems. Uh, in terms of the future, with w one of the problems I will tell you with the Department of Justice was we have too many children taken out of the home. We're number one per capita in the country. We also are number 10 in, in, the, in the nation in terms of number of children uh, in congregate care. We're gonna reduce that number by 25% by December 2021. So, and we have, with the Department of Justice, 
uh, and in, with the memorandum, in the memorandum of understanding, a contract that we put out for bid with the University of Maryland, who are experts at child welfare. So we are doing, and there are consultants, and they're assisting us in this, as well as providing some oversight for the Department of Justice to make sure we're doing what we said we're going to do. So again, for a New York law firm to come in here and say, we want to have a role in this, th there is no role for them in this. There is no role for them in this. So we're moving forward and we're going to fix the problem. Uh, we just don't believe that uh, they should be part of this. We're partnered with the West Virginia legislature. The governor's made this a priority and we're carrying through on it. And we've got the Department of Justice and the University of Maryland uh, folks and we're very confident we're going we're to make more progress. Thank you. As we're talking about the, the foster care, um, uh, the increase in the caseload, the biggest culprit is normally uh, considered to be the, the substance abuse epidemic. But what are the other reasons you see, and I'll start at this end because you talked a little bit about uh, you know grandparents and, and, and having skipped a generation in their homes and that kind of thing. Is it all the substance abuse epidemic or is there something more going on? It's my understanding that 84% of the uh, grandparents when asked why they're having to care uh, for their grandchildren or uh, non-biological child is the substance use disorder. Now, again, I think you can get it a little more basic or think about it from a more basic standpoint. And, and again, it's, uh, it's whether or not there's a, a loss of, you know, not being able to get a job, not being able to have that uh, uh, purpose in life that uh, that results in drug abuse. So again, we you know in areas where there's a high poverty, where there's uh, you know if you have a high ACE score, then the child ha has much higher rate or risk of being addicted themselves. So uh, I think you have to look at those societal issues where where you have uh, uh, you know basically two tiers of people: people that have it and people that don't have it. And uh, again, you've seen that the uh, divide has been dramatic. The, in about 10 or 20 years, the, the rich are two times richer and the poor are two times poorer. And so, uh, uh, and again, West Virginia, and particularly, you know, in my area where it, we were totally dependent on coal, uh, I think that uh, is an overall driving force uh, that ultimately results in, um, you know, bad outcomes, be it substance abuse or be it uh, truancy, things like that. We don't have any representatives of law enforcement up here, but we, we do have medicine and, and kind of a faith-based perspective. But what are some of those other social, cultural um, issues that you think are contributing to what's happening to, to the kids who, you know, some of whom end up in the foster care system, but, but also just in general, the, the generation that seems to be suffering right now? Um, I, I agree with my friend, Senator Stallings. If you look at the statistics, we've seen a dramatic rise in the number of children in foster care in the last eight years. And it's all driven by the substance abuse problem. I mean, that's just what the data shows. Now, uh, why do people, so the real question is, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, in a lot of cases, for a lot of reasons, people turn to substance abuse and then that led to a bad family situation and it led the state to do what they did. We really, to, to make headway on the foster care part of it, a, a, an integral part is going to be we have to get families back together and functional and employment is going to go a long ways because as, as Senator Maynard said, it, it, Idle hands are the devil's workshop, and, and we've got to get people back to work in this state and make it possible for them to work. People can be rehabilitated, but if you've got to be able to get them back in the workforce when they're rehabilitated. If, they're, if it's on the record forever then, and they can't get back in the, in the workplace, then that's gonna, the family's going to be under stress. They're going to be under a lot of stress. So we just simply have to focus on building up our families.
I have uh, some figures here. There's 7,000 children that are in in state now, state placement, and uh, a foster care ombudsman has been named Pamela Woodman Kaler, and uh, she's in the office of the Inspector General. So hoping that can uh, help some things. Um, I don't think we've mentioned the foster care bill from last session, and uh, Etna is going to run that MCO. Uh, to kind of help, I think, relieve some of the pressure from the DHHR. So um, one personal topic that I think it needs to be discussed is the, the wait time for foster parents before, the, before they can be approved. And I just heard last week that the House is working on a way to speed, to expedite that. Um, I think with our uh, state police background checks, um, and I'm sure that the secretary would love to see uh, a sp more speedy process for these foster parents that are willing to uh, bring kids in their home and aren't able to because they haven't, you know, gone through all the processes. But uh, two, back to the original question, um, you know, faith-based isn't right for all, but I think it uh, is definitely important, uh, and especially when you get to a low point in your life. Um, and I've never, like I say, been in a low point from drug addiction, but I have had uh, times that, you know, I was down and out and uh, having a, a faith-based relationship and somebody to foster that can definitely be a help. So what other pieces, I know there are some faith-based pieces, um, but but that's not quite legislative just yet, but what other pieces are there in place to keep some of these kids who are being pulled into the foster care system from then being part of the cycle themselves? Are there educational pieces? Do they, it, what do you guys, uh, or do you at all work with the kids on, on that aspect? Uh, absolutely. Uh, family First, I'm sure everyone's heard about uh, the Family First Prevention Act uh, was signed uh, over a year ago by the president. They allowed a long lead time to get uh, Family First uh, developed because it's a complicated program. Uh, West Virginia is one of the first adopters. There, there are many states who have not tackled this yet. Uh, we took it on virtually immediately uh, to utilize this program to keep children, help keep children at home. I, I've talked about uh, 37, I guess 38 years ago now, the, the federal government said we want to help states protect children and keep children safe. The biggest problem uh, was abuse. So uh, the federal government said, we will help states, but only if you take those children into custody and they're part of your, they're your responsibility. Family first, for the first time in almost 40 years, we do not have to take those, that child out of the home. Uh, we do not have to take custody of that child necessarily. So where it's feasible and where we, we know the child is still safe, by bringing in other resources, which may be the grandmother, may be someone uh, coming in during the day, may, may be as simple as, as providing food or transportation, uh, uh, but also providing where appropriate uh, treatment services for mothers or fathers who have a substance use uh, problem. 51% uh, of our children taken out of the home, the primary reason is substance use. Uh, substance use disorder is, is we have a, an estimated 154,000 people in West Virginia that have a substance use disorder. Our treatment programs have gotten better, and I'll we'll talk a little bit later maybe when we get into that in terms of the number of treatment beds which the legislature uh, made possible through uh, use of the Ryan Brown Fund. Uh, and the legislature, as, as the senator said, made, uh, made us, uh, helped us get a Medicare managed care program. Uh, Aetna was the, the bidder on that that was selected. They're going to give us another set of eyes to make sure these children don't fall through the cracks. But it's still not enough. Uh, where we are right now, I mentioned putting 60 individuals out, to, uh, new individuals out into the community. I don't want to shock our, my legislative uh, uh, friends up here. We're adding 87 individuals to, uh, out throughout the state of West Virginia into the CPS and related programs. We have to have more manpower. In 2014, we had 320 CPS workers in the state for 4,200, uh, I'm using round numbers, 4,200 children. 
uh, in 2000, late 2017, 2018, we had right at 7,000, a little over 7,000 7, children, and we still had 30, uh, 320 CPS workers. We didn't react soon enough, but we're reacting now. We've added 60, we're gonna add 87. If we need more than that, we'll add more than that. This problem has to be fixed. The children have to be kept safe. They're the priority, so we're adding huge resources to this program. And, and again, legislature's been our partner. There are several bills we've already been made aware of. They're gonna come out this year with regard to child welfare. So we're happy to do this in a partnership with the legislature, and it's just been a, a terrific way to, to move forward right now. Okay. Uh, the change happened almost immediately. We stopped saying, or stopped saying opioid abuse and started saying substance abuse. Um, and I know uh, in Wood County, we were told a year ago, opioids aren't the problem anymore. It's meth again. It's it, cocaine has come back. Um, so, uh, again, starting at this end, does that change the way you talk about treatment legislatively or, you know, some of these laws we're talking about with, um, do we become a more, little more lenient with those who have been incarcerated for drug char charges? Is it is it different because it was meth? I mean, what, does that change the discussion at all? Uh, <clears throat> yes, I mean, again, uh, the issue is, again, when someone changes from a uh, chronic pain patient to a substance use disorder, that by definition, they've, they're doing things wrong or doctor shopping or something like that. When it's just opioids, when it's, you know, they've, you find marijuana in their system, or, or if you find meth in their system. A lot of times, getting them into recovery is an issue. Sometimes they want to get in recovery, but there's not a soft enough handoff for that. So one of the bills we passed was that uh, substance use disorder could be treated, integrated into primary care which I think has got a lot of uh, potential. So you don't have to hand off this patient, get them to another place. Uh, they, you can treat them in your office. Now that said, traditionally, we would, we would try to cover that opioid receptor, just like we would try to cover an insulin receptor, okay? So the treatment of uh, you know, people that have uh, substance use disorder from opioids these people have a disease and they, you have to treat them that way. So the old Suboxone or Methadone or Sublocade, some of those things would be used. But if it's meth, you're exactly right. It's a different ball game. There is no necessarily an antidote to meth. Uh, and so that's something that has to be looked at as we go forward. Now there's certain medicines that can help calm you down, uh, uh, do away with the agitation, uh, things like that, that's going on in the, uh, the ER setting, but yeah, it's a, it's a different animal and it's a game of walk em all where you hit down on this and it pops up somewhere else. You're so right on that. And it's a, a regional difference too. What's going on in the Eastern Panhandle and Parkersburg is different than what's going on in the coal fields, uh, as you know. So uh, it's a, a multi-pronged uh, attack and we also have to uh, look at research. Our centers of Higher education need to be researching uh, better ways to treat different types of drug use. So it's a challenge. Well, I think it's, it's a huge challenge for our friends in law enforcement because when you had the pill mills, uh, they were, we were a little late to really start getting on that, but they were there, they were identifiable, and now that we've got the prescription drug monitoring programs, uh, we've ferreted a lot of that out. And it's, uh, as you've alluded, it's, it's very difficult now. Uh, my friends in law enforcement say Oxycontin's on the street are, are eight times what uh, a, per, you know, a dose of heroin is. And, but it's very difficult for our friends in law enforcement to uh, track this and one of the huge problems, and you're gonna see some legislation coming forward on this. Uh, we, we talked in the earlier session about the number of people, I think the speaker brought up, that are in regional jails. 
waiting trial. One of the main reasons your local prosecutors will tell you is they have to get the evidence. So if the person that's accused of a crime doesn't fess up and plea bargain and it has to go to trial, well, they have to prove that is meth or that is cocaine or whatever. And we are way behind in getting the criminal testing done. And hence, a lot of people are, are in our regional jail system. And so we're going to look at some things to try to speed that up. But, uh, yeah, we, this is a, it's a huge problem. And it's, the, the problem's not so much prescription drugs anymore. And that's, if anything, that's made it even more infiltrated into our communities and harder to track. So, but, uh, you know, it's just something we've got to do. We've got to give law enforcement the tools they need to get the job done. One thing the uh, legislator, legislature has done is uh, we passed the Opioid Reduction Act, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, that limited uh, prescription to four-day supply in an emergency or urgent care setting and minors to three days, and um, also amended the code to define how the uh, West Virginia CSMP data can be shared with prescriber state agencies. So, uh, so we're trying to uh, do some things that actually is a umbrella that can help no matter what the current addiction problem is uh, to, to handle that in a generic way and then trying to also specifically um, as the need arises figure out what the latest addiction problem is. Two of my first goals in 2017 uh, were to reduce the number of overdose deaths and get more people into treatment. In 2018, uh, our mortality rates, and these run months behind, I realize it's 2020, it takes uh, six months uh, or so to get toxicology reports back to really determine for sure that it was an overdose. And we then also get the breakdown of what, uh, what drugs were in the individual system. And virtually everyone now uh, overdoses with multiple drugs, not just one. Uh, but we, the overdose death, uh, rate, and we're the highest in the country still, uh, was reduced in 2018 uh, by about 6 percent. Now, we've had increases the two years before that of 22 percent increase and a 13 percent increase, 13.6 or 14 percent increase. So we went from 22 percent to 13 percent to a reduction of 6 percent. That's great, and, and we're very happy about that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, some of the statements here are, are, are very accurate with regard to the switch from opioids to heroin or to meth. Meth is much more difficult to overdose on. So we have more people on meth than we had two years ago, or even last year probably, and more people on heroin. So uh, it, we can't get too excited about the fact that we had a reduction of 6% when, when overdoses are, are, are fewer with regard to, to those individuals. But I will tell you, we got uh, year, late 2017 or early 2018, we put a million dollars worth of naloxone throughout the state, 42,000 doses. We're still putting naloxone out there. That's to reduce deaths. Uh, we also have, have documented uh, over a thousand individuals have gone into treatment just through our harm reduction programs. So we have more people going into treatment now. At some point, if we keep this up and we keep pushing in the direction we're pushing, we're going to see a real reduction. We're going to see a real change in terms of the number of individuals. It is slow going. Half of the people that go into treatment drop out of treatment. So you end up with 1,500 completing treatment. You then get those other individuals who dropped out to come back along with others, and you get another 1,000, and then part of that group drops out. So it's very slow going to get people cured, and then there's never a cure, uh, that was the wrong term, to, to get people clean and off of drugs and back into the workforce, which we're working on with uh, the governor's program of Jobs and Hopes. We have 625 people that are enrolled and are getting training. I believe two or 300 of those are actually uh, employed. We're still growing with that program. We expect that to, to come close to tripling in this next year. So that last part of that puzzle with regard to getting people clean and then not having them go back to their home and sometimes back to their dealer is very important. You have, they have to have 
the ability and the hope to know that they're going to have a job when they get out of, uh, of the treatment and, and go to outpatient services, and then they're going to get their life in order. So we're trying to put all these pieces together, and we are truly making progress with this. Okay, I want to back up to something that you mentioned a bit ago uh, when you were talking about family first. And I think that in a lot of cases that we see, and, and again, I'm fortunate that what I'm seeing is anecdotal, but um, there seems to be a generational pattern to some of the behavior that leads to kids being in foster care. So is it truly the case that the best approach is to make sure the kids stay with their family first? Those are clearly individual decisions, and I try to qualify that with in, in circumstances where the child can safely remain in the home, uh, data shows that they do better. Even if there are problems in the home, even if a parent, one or both parents have a substance use disorder, children staying with their parents long term, the outcomes seem to be better. So that is our effort, is to keep those children with the, with the family, but to work on the entire family and not just pull the child out and try to provide counseling to the child and, and without bringing the parents into that full term. So. When you say outcomes, what specifically are the markers you look at? Uh, in the children who get into uh, who, uh, crime, who uh, may, may have uh, suicide rates, uh, I, I don't have all that information. I can certainly get it. There are a number of criteria that show that children do better staying with their families. All right, this one's a little easier um, because we've talked a lot about what's already been done. But I'd like to hear from each of you something that's on your wish list that you think needs to be accomplished in the upcoming session to address um, it, the substance abuse epidemic, but maybe also the, the economic cycle that has contributed to it and both of those things as they then affect the foster care caseload. So we'll, we'll start here. I just think we have to uh, support the grand families and the kinship care. I think we need to look at what we're paying uh, foster care uh, parents and uh, kinship care. Parents, my understanding for you're caring for a, a niece or nephew, I think it's around $200 a month. If I'm wrong, tell me. Uh, and uh, and again, we just have to do those uh, those in-home services, and we have to focus on the first thousand days of a child's life. So again, the West Virginia State University's Healthy Grand Families Project. The model consists of two components. The first is discussion groups for grandparents held weekly on topics over a three-month period, tailored to the needs of grand families, allowed by social work support services provided on an individual basis over a six-month period. So we have to amp up whoever's caring for these, these, uh, these children. Uh, and also, something that we probably haven't done as well is treat mental health issues. That's a big deal. Mental health issues, depression, uh, bipolar disorder, these people that have these diseases, uh, particularly bipolar, uh, they're not going to be good parents, typically, unless their disease state is treated. And we've, uh, we've been pretty stingy with our mental health providers. Uh, we've had uh, these comprehensive uh, mental health uh, facilities, they're, they're trying. Um, and again, when I say stingy, it's not for the lack of effort. I mean, I, I, I applaud uh, Secretary Crouch's efforts. And, and, but at the same time, in a, a real world, I mean, we, you know, sometimes you have to pay people. Sometimes you have to uh, incentivize people caring for these very complex and, and uh, so I would, I would say we have to look at the budget and see where we're going to strategically place some funding that can ultimately save a whole lot of money on the back end, if you will. Uh, I think another place that we really have to look at is, is how people age out of foster care. You know, when we have to give those children support because it's my understanding that about half of the people that go out of foster care, end up being incarcerated. So, I mean, again, it's, it's that early investment, strategic investment uh, in, in grand families, in, uh, 
in the birth to three, uh, first thousand days of a child's life, uh, in the education, the wraparound services, I think how we can use our a robust system of uh, federally qualified health centers, which can provide this counseling service for schools and for uh, counseling service for people that are coming into my office to have their recovery integrated. They still have to have counseling. How we use telemedicine. Uh, those are things that we're going to be working on over the, this uh, next session to make it uh, a more robust uh, situation. But again, I, I think we can't just continue to think that we can cut our way uh, out of uh, out of these issues. Um, as the senator alluded to, you're going to hear a lot of good ideas, and they are. They're all good ideas. They all come with a price tag. So if, if you, you said, give me one thing, and I'll tell you that I think this state has gotten and is going to hopefully continue to get major sums of money from the settlement of lawsuits from drug manufacturers and distributors. I personally, and you're going to see some legislation to this effect, uh, would like to see the, the settlement money that's obtained behalf, on the behalf of the taxpayers of the state of West Virginia come back to the legislature for appropriation for the substance abuse problem. Now, that could include uh, strengthening families. It could include prevention, treatment. Uh, one of the things is the Ryan Brown uh, Recovery Fund. Is Our funds are exhausted right now. The state in the last two years has put $22 million in that. It's increased, or by the end of this year, uh, we will be up to, I think, 952 beds of uh, that statewide, we needed that, but we have to keep the momentum going. We need beds for neonatal abstinence syndrome around the state. Right now, the only bed you have is in Huntington. We need some startup money for that, but I would like to see this settlement money is obtained on behalf of the state of West Virginia because there's a problem that was created. Let's put the settlement money towards fixing the problems that that created. And the federal. There's, there's federal money being pushed out as well. Mm -hmm. we, we really do have to use <clears throat> whatever funding we have to the highest and greatest need. I have a uh, AAA road service company in Wayne County. On Christmas Day, got a call. Uh, I have some help, but I'm running mostly myself. Uh, Calling, there was a gentleman that had locked his keys up at the golf course. I, he was didn't have any family around. He was golfing on Christmas Day. And I normally, when I talk to customers, I, I, in the beginning for the past few years, I didn't tell them my position. But recently I've started telling them, you know, so in case they need something or need help, you know, I'll give them my card. Um, so I ended up, I told this gentleman, and he was a CPS worker. And ends up he had done an amazing amount of research and he'd seen the problem firsthand and we exchanged emails or I gave him my card and he sent me this email and um, I read it was a story about I could tell someone he knew and it was pretty horrific and as I read end up it was his mom and but he had saw all this firsthand and he actually had some solutions and I forwarded that email to your deputy secretary and I want to brag on your deputy secretary he has been awesome to work with uh, his name's Jeremiah Samples and been a great friend of the legislature and totally uh, just doing a wonderful job so um, he he mentioned that you know in addition to focusing on beds and treatments his experience was post-recovery he said he's seen firsthand these people get out and they can maybe get a job at a convenient store making minimum wage and then they see their two when they get out their community is gone because they had this little circle of friends that all had the same problem as them and then when they get out there's really nobody to turn to and I know in many cases probably they had already uh, exhausted their family 
you know, at times when, and um, so he says to look at post recovery and these people will come out, like say, get a job or have an opportunity for minimum wage. And then they see these other people that are selling drugs or with prostitution and they turn around and get right back into it, which is recidivism, which is probably, you know, a big, huge expense too. So that's something to look at. And it was a very, very meaningful conversation. Um, one other thing is, is our unemployment rate. And like I said earlier, um, you know, I think the lack of jobs is, is part of the problem. And uh, Mr. Secretary, I, uh, during a interim committee in my economic development, I brought in the um, DHHR, uh, Division of Personnel and Workforce West Virginia. I wondered what type of communication that they all had. And ended up, there was a requirement from the DHHR to contact the um, Workforce West Virginia one time, but I would like to see more stringent policies. And my personal, I'm a small businessman, and I was raised by uh, depression era parents, so I'm, and I try to spend the state's money like my own, which is pretty conservative. And so my idea is, so we have state employees that we pay, and then we have people that are down on their luck that we're trying to to get back on their feet, but I would like to see these people that are able-bodied to have an opportunity with a job through the West Virginia personnel or through Workforce West Virginia to help. So, and then lastly is what I've already spoke to, and that's outdoor recreation. I know uh, many probably can't draw the line between the dots, but, um, you know, these hobbies are just there's not enough hours in the day for me because my hobbies are varied. Even my small business is my hobby. And, uh, and I try to do that through legislation, which, you know, in this legislation says nothing about drug addiction or nothing about overdoses or treatment or recovery, but in a roundabout way, it, I really feel it can, can help people. So thank you. Um, we're not the only state with these problems. We may be the, the state with the highest overdose rate. We may be the state with the uh, most children taken out of the home per capita, but we're not the only state. Uh, we have a great number of states out there to learn from who are trying different, different things. We believe strongly, I believe strongly in evidence-based programs, programs that have a proven result and that, that do uh, achieve results. Uh, and I've stated time and time again that we're going to focus our funding on evidence-based programs. Uh, just to tell you what we've done a little bit with the amount of money, and I, I want to give our, our two senators, uh, our, our um, senators uh, Capito and Manchin, some credit here. West Virginia is 0.56% of the national population, of the U.S. population. When they provide funding uh, to states based upon population, we don't come out very good. They went to bat in 2017 or so, started working on a way to improve the funding that comes to West Virginia. And consequently, of I believe it was $150 billion that was provided for, um, for the substance use disorder uh, to, to spread to states uh, throughout the country. We would have gotten $15 million of that. And, and I may be a little off on the total amount here. Um, instead, they took a, a 20 million or, or so off of the top of that and based that allocation on overdose deaths, uh, prevalence of, of the disease, et cetera. And we ended up with $75 million over a little over 12 month period. Now, that sounds like a lot of money. Uh, when you spread that out for, through a variety of programs, it, uh, it, it doesn't go quite as far as you would hope. But uh, let me mention just a few things we've done. One of the first things we did was contract with, with WVU uh, and uh, Marshall and uh, the osteopathic school to make sure that individuals who face this problem, clinical folks, are trained properly because SUD is a, is a difficult problem. It's a, it's a mental health disease. It's a brain disorder. And uh, there's a stigma to that. There's still a stigma to that. So we wanted to make sure folks are trained properly throughout the state of West Virginia. Uh, we also provided money uh, to communities who were prepared to develop quick response teams. 
I'm sure you've heard of those. Uh, there were none in 2016. We now have 20 counties, 20, 20 communities that have quick response teams where if an individual overdoses, information is provided to that team and they go out within 24 to 48 hours. Uh, in the long term, 72 hours, they try to get there sooner. And they start talking to these individuals who overdose about getting into treatment. Um, that's been successful. It's not, they don't go into treatment the first time. They learn that. They have to go back over and over again, develop a relationship with that individual, and eventually convince that person they, they should go into treatment and they can help them do that. Uh, we have also uh, 10 law enforcement uh, assisted diversions where instead of taking individuals to jail, uh, law enforcement takes them to a treatment facility or to somewhere where they can get help rather than be incarcerated. Uh, we have higher education campus support. We've got, we have 10 uh, college campuses where we've provided grants to help individuals who are in school, who are trying to, to get an education, who might have an SUD problem to provide them support and help them if they need to get further treatment or assistance. Uh, we have a long-acting reversible contraception program that we, we're, we're putting everywhere we can to get individuals, women who are in, in uh, might be incarcerated, so that when they come out, uh, that, they, that they don't have a family unprepared to have that family, so that there's planning with regard to that. Um, we have uh, a, a fairly new program, a uh, pregnant and postpartum mothers program. We're now in uh, five of the seven regions in the state, the, the uh, Office of Drug Control Policy regions. We have one we've funded in the northern panhandle, which will make six, and, uh, or eastern panhandle, and one other in the northern panhandle that we're about to get funded. So we're going to have postpartum programs. The first one was in Huntington, by the way. Um, as, as Senator Rohrbach uh, mentioned that. That's a program where we have 18, we funded 18 apartments that are set up for mothers who are dependent, but they can keep their children with them so that there is actually a playground in the, in, in the place. They have uh, individuals who can take care of their children while they go to treatment, trying to get the mothers clean, but keep the family together at the same time. We're going to have similar programs throughout the state of West Virginia, seven of those. Uh, we have uh, treatment beds. Uh, Senator Rohrbach mentioned those. We're going to have 952 or 54 treatment beds in the state. Their uh, legislation pa that passed those added 450. We only had 200 some beds in the state. We have over 1,200 recovery beds in West Virginia. Uh, we have MAT in all 10 regional jails, which is huge. Of the 154,000 individuals in West Virginia that, that are, uh, uh, have SUD, 19,000 of those were in, incarcerated. So we've got treatment for those individuals. So when they come out clean, and, and hopefully we can get them straight into a, a treatment program uh, as they come out. That's our intent. That's what we're trying to do, and we're working with DMAPS on that and Secretary Sandy. Um, so we have done a, a great number of things to tackle this problem. Again, if half of your children are taken out of the home because of an SUD problem, you have to fight that problem and, and, and do everything you can to combat that problem, as well as the other issues related to child welfare. And I think we're doing, I think we're doing all of that at this point. I also want to mention just quickly, I don't want to leave out the judiciary in this. We have a great relationship where we're providing training uh, programs with the judiciary so that we get them as partners in this. Because you have to remember, ultimately it's the judge that makes the decision on those children. And many times the recommendation of the multidisciplinary team goes to the judge. And many times the judge is not sure about that. So we're trying to beef that up a little bit and make sure we get uh, good recommendations uh, to the judge because we they rely on on our folks and as well as the guardian ad litem for the child to make good decisions for those children but we're trying to bring them on and we are bringing them on as, as partners as well okay quickly because I know Don's ready to start handing the mic around but um, I wanted to give you a chance to mention um, we've talked so far about illegal substances being used and I think that um, if I understood correctly, maybe that there are some legal substances that you think might be just as big a problem in some ways, if, if you wanted to just briefly address that. Uh, well, one of the things that, that the speaker and I've talked about, and we're going to start on my committee, is uh, we have a real epidemic in our school children with vaping. And I, 
I see a lot of heads nod out there, and it's in every city and county in this state. So we're going to try to tackle that problem. I'd like to see some more funding behind our tobacco quit line, particularly the RAISE program, which is a peer-driven, student-driven initiative in our schools. Uh, when we got in a budget crunch about three or four years ago, we basically took almost all the funding for that. I'd love to see that put back in. Uh, we really need to start monitoring the sales of tobacco and vaping products to underage children. And, and you know, one of the bills I had marked for reintroduction was T21. Obviously, we don't need that now. We just got that a few weeks ago in the federal budget bill. But we've got to monitor that because we, we really, for the health and well-being of our children in schools, uh, we just really, I feel very strongly that that, that is a substance of abuse now and we need to tackle it. Uh, so we're not just going to deal with uh, illegal substances, uh, but we need healthier kids and we need healthier environments at school. And, and we, I, some counties report on, uh, I know somebody talked to me last night, uh, in their county they'd just done a survey. 50% of the seniors in their high schools were vaping. 50%. We got to do better than that. So we're going to put a, a real focus with some legislation and hopefully funding on that problem in particular. Okay. I, I know we don't have another hour and a quarter to get into the question I'm about to ask, so just a quick answer. Earlier, Secretary Crouch said that about 51% of the children removed from homes are removed because of something related to drug abuse. Well, that tells me that 49% have nothing to do with drug abuse. Senator Stallings talked about uh, better mental health programs in general. So quickly, what are your feelings? First, how much better do we need to do on general mental health? And is there any prospect of it being done? Again, uh, I think that the federally qualified health centers basically are around the state. Uh, they, do, they do get cost-based reimbursement, and a lot of this, uh, we're talking about Medicaid funding. So with the match rate for every dollar West Virginia spends on mental health, the federal government spends three. So you get a bigger bang for the buck on that, and uh, I think we have to look at that. I, you know, it, it starts with... Uh, uh, you know, physicians and, and care providers wanting to go into psychiatry or mental health or counseling. And it's not been an attractive field uh, over the, you know, the past few years. It's hard work. Uh, you don't get a lot of uh, immediate gratification, if you would. But uh, it's absolutely necessary uh, to prevent some of these other things. So uh, I just think we have to use the tools in our toolbox and expand uh, and again, in rural areas, that, that really uh, yields to telehealth pretty well. There's a lot of mental health, telehealth going on around the state of West Virginia. I think how we enhance that, uh, uh, and then again, how we pay for it. And again, if, we can, if it's Medicaid, federal government's kicking in 3 to $1. As a, as a health care provider, I can tell you there's no question Mental health is probably the most underserved aspect of our health care global universe. Uh, but we did do one bill last year that I will mention to, to help with this problem a bit. House Bill 2674, creating a student loan repayment program for mental health providers. So the state is now going to put some money into educating people if they go into these fields, because we're fully aware, and this, I, I can tell you, I just came back from an NCSL meeting recently, and we had a whole two-hour seminar about how underserved, particularly mental health is, and, and that we've just got to do better. But we're not in that boat alone, but we've got to figure out ways to encourage more people to be providers in mental health, because in a lot of cases, those are some of the most acute access to care issues that we've got in the healthcare system now. 
I'll be real quick. Let me uh, finish the statistics. The uh, of the uh, we had, I said 51 percent, um, which is accurate from for for are taken out of the home children for substance use disorder. About uh, 35 percent are taken out for neglect, and uh, 15 percent are um, are generally considered. Children's behavior, child behavior problems. Those tend to be more adolescents, more uh, more teens. Um, one of the things I haven't mentioned is we received last week or the week before uh, uh, an SED waiver for Medicaid. That's a serious emotional disturbance waiver for Medicaid to help us take care of children who have. Uh, higher needs or more needs than most children that are taken out of the home. So these these would probably co cover some of these adolescents that are having behavior problems. So that waiver, uh, we're, we're one of a few states. We're not. Uh, this is not a, a huge number of states that have been able to do this. We got this waiver as a part of fixing or taking another step forward with our child welfare uh, program. So that's going to be instrumental here uh, in what we do in the next couple of years. The last report I read on psychiatrists, we were meeting 66% of the need for psychiatrists. But that's not the whole story. The, the, the providers that we need are generally uh, bachelor and master level psychologists, folks to help with these children and help with uh, substance use disorder uh, patients or individuals. Uh, and we're only meeting about 16.8 or 17 percent of that need. So we have a huge workforce problem. We're working on that. We have funded uh, 22 clinicians to date over the past, I think it's just been six months or so, to a year. Um, to who will spend at least two years in West Virginia. That number is going to double in another six months. So we're trying to, to re recruit and retain uh, providers, clinicians in West Virginia just through D what DHHR is doing and with the help of the legislature again. I'm going to add one more thing to that. It, and it, again, it's another, it's, it's more evidence of, of how aware the legislature is this problem. One of the major components of the legislation on the education reform bill that was passed in the second special session of this legislature had to deal with the wraparound services. So we dramatically increased the funding in every county in this state for mental health services in our schools in the form of counselors and nurses. So I think you can see, if you, if you look at the substance of that bill, that was a major part of that bill. And I think you're going to see some results from that. But that, again, is to try to get help where the children are at in their schools. So I, uh, I think that's a major component of what we've done. So we're very aware of the need for more mental health care. And it's still with the mental health issue. Um, in talking with, uh, just this week, the CEO of Sharp Hospital uh, talked about the dual diagnoses of people that have substance abuse and of both illegal and, and legal. And Christine, you asked about other legal substances, and I haven't heard the word alcohol mentioned at all amongst this panel. And when you talk about the homeless in Huntington, the homeless in Charleston, that's the number one problem right there. They can't afford the other drugs, but they sure can not afford cheap alcohol. And I haven't heard that mentioned. But as to mental health, we find out that there's these dual diagnoses, that people that have this substance abuse problem are using those substances to treat their mental health illness. And when you talk to our state's mental hygiene commissioners, you find out that their hands are tied, that you can only have somebody involuntarily committed for 28 or 30 days. And then if he's or she is not a danger to themselves or others, they're released. And many of those people are into recidivism. They'll go back and back again because their mental health issues, which are the core of their problem, aren't treated. You see a state like Ohio, two or three other states. And I know Delegate Mick Bates tried to put forward a, uh, a bill last year that looks harder at involuntary treatment of those that have these severe mental health problems that places like Prestera and other places don't have the 
facilities, the funding, the personnel to handle. Um, something needs to be done about that, doesn't it? I, I don't want to dominate the microphone here, but let me respond very quickly. I think you'll see some legislation. We're, we're working right now on some legislation uh, to try to fix some of those issues with regard to, to uh, the length of time people are incarcerated, et cetera, uh, and, and those commitments. Uh, let me just say, when I say 51% of the children are taken from home for SUD, that's the primary reason. In up to 82, 83% of the homes, there is, and many times it's alcohol, a factor in, in t removing a child from a home. It may not be the primary reason, but alcohol is, you're absolutely right, is, a, is still a huge problem, and uh, it's, it's one that we are trying to address as well. You are going to see some legislation, and I've been involved with drafting it. Uh, I've been working with the state of Kentucky, particularly on, they have something called Casey's Law. Now, one of the things, though, that's come out in my research on that bill is our system of mental hygiene warrants and petitions and the, how that whole system functions, uh, our system needs some upgrading. Uh, it, not even in regard to substance abuse, but just in general. So I think that every time we've, we've looked into that, we've, we've turned over another rock. So I think we're going to get into kind of a comprehensive review of the whole uh, system of, of mental health warrants, mental health hygiene system, and try to get some substantial changes and upgrades there that will include substance abuse disorder. Uh, but to just do that in a vacuum, we've looked at that and, and we probably got some deeper problems than what we appreciate because I, I'll be honest with you, and you alluded to it, a lot of states are ahead of where we're at in this regard. So we, the more I've got into this and have worked with some folks in the Commonwealth of Kentucky and in the state of Ohio and seen how their systems work, uh, we need to upgrade. Well, one of, the big, one of the big problems in the state of West Virginia is the law enforcement aspect is all sheriff driven. So we could have somebody that was running in and out of traffic here on Greenbrier and thought that they needed taken in and checked out. The whole problem is every bit of that falls back on the sheriff. They have to find the mental hygiene commissioner. They have to transport them there. They have to watch them. Then if they're committed to Bateman or Sharp, they have to transport them there. And we've got small counties where they may only have one or two deputies on a shift. So if they have to transport somebody from a rural area of this state, and it's a three or four hour drive over to uh, Bateman and Huntington, that, that, that's, they, they've involved the, half of their law enforcement is tied up in transportation. So our whole system needs reevaluated, and that's, I think that's the take home message because I've actually spent a fair amount of time over the last inter, you know, interims and we had a hearing on this in LACRA in the, in the last, uh, in the December interims and I've, I've spent a lot of time, but it's, it's a deeper problem than just extending our current mental health hygiene warrant system to say, okay, well, that's going to include substance abuse now. It's a deeper problem than that because we, we probably need to spiff our entire system up and make it flow a little better. Uh, and that I would hope that substance use then will be included in that. Uh, I'm sure it will be. But I think you're going to see some comprehensive legislation come forward on, on some real changes there. And with that, we would like to have a round of applause for our panelists. This has been excellent. I think you guys have done a great job. We really appreciate it. It's an issue that every paper cares about. Chris, thank you. I, I have a housekeeping question, and, and forgive me if I misunderstood something, but I want to make sure I know the difference between the 952 beds you talked about as part of the Ryan Brown law and the 1,200 beds you mentioned. What's... Treatment beds are where... Uh, treatment beds are where individuals receive... Um, uh, evidence-based services like MAT, medication-assisted treatment, 
recovery beds are where they get peer support uh, and may go to outpatient services for, for okay, treatment. So there's no doubling up there? No. No, and, and a lot of the recovery bed part of that has to do with the, uh, the recovery housing uh, bill that I sponsored in the last legislature because we want these beds to be under some level of oversight to, to assure that we're getting uh, a quality product for, for what uh, the secretary is writing the check for. Uh, we want people in safe environments getting some treatment and some peer support. So that those no, those are very uh, hand in glove uh, treatment then recovery. Don, I would like yeah. to take 30 seconds and Certainly. mention something that's prying on me. Uh, last week, a constituent called me that's a businessman, and his wife is a nurse practitioner, and he's came up with a program called Wheels to Recovery, and it's a portable recovery uh, system that can travel about the state. He's going to be in the locker meeting at the interim uh, meeting next week. Uh, explaining more of it for anybody that's interested. It sounds like an interesting uh, idea, but thank you, Don. Interims are to Capitol next week. I'm sure the agenda is already posted, and we go online and look. And uh, uh, more housekeeping again. Chris, thank you very much. Excellent panel. Again, another round of applause for everybody. It's, it's been great. I want to thank all of you for coming. It's been a long day. I hope this has been beneficial. There have been great panels. And I'll let you know that uh, Dalton Walker's photos will be sent out to all the papers, to your editor's email address, or to our media, uh, to our uh, also to our radio and TV listing. So if you get our news sharing, you should get the photos. And if you don't, shoot me an email, and I'll send it directly to you. So we'll provide that for all that. Uh, the video will be it was live streamed. It was also recorded. It will be on YouTube, and we'll share links, and you can embed it on your own sites. Uh, again, thank all of you for coming. This is the end of the day. We hope you enjoyed it. February 6th for our legislative breakfast. And with that, uh, thank you and our day is over.